Well, we're going to continue our study of the Lord's Prayer. So let me just read that uh, prayer for you once more. That portion of Scripture that is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, these are stressful times for many reasons as we grapple with the COVID-19 epidemic. The uh, probably the greatest source of stress in our lives are circumstances that are outside our control, like COVID-19, circumstances where we feel powerless to do anything, to make any changes. You know, I think, how can I stop the spread of this virus? How can I protect myself from the impact or the virus itself on my life? I'm concerned about my family. Jane is going back to school in the fall, and I don't know what that means. And how she's going to hold up under that. I'm concerned about my granddaughter and her exposure to COVID-19 as she starts school. If there is an outbreak in her class, what does that mean for her? What does that mean for Jane and I as her grandparents? What does it mean for her mother who is suffering from multiple sclerosis? I'm worried about my oldest daughter as she resumes teaching at Niagara College. I have no control over COVID-19. I can't stop the spread of that uh, virus within my family or community, except by totally isolating myself on some Arctic island where uh, I won't see anybody for the next uh, 10 years. The greatest source of stress for most of us are circumstances that are beyond our control, where we feel we are powerless to make the changes that we need or to deal with those circumstances. It could be an unexpected job loss. It could be an unexpected, unexplained illness. It could be the loss of a a loved one or a virus like COVID-19. We are going to uh, face these kinds of circumstances as disciples of Christ. So the answer or the question for me is how do we deal with these uncontrollable circumstances uh, in our lives? How do we deal with them in a way that brings glory to God and peace to us as his followers or as followers of Jesus Christ? Well, I think the answer to that is found in the second and third uh, petitions in the Lord's Prayer. The first petition was hallowed be thy name. We talked about that last week and go back and see, uh, take a look at that. The next petitions are your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's begin by looking at that, that first petition, your kingdom come. So what is the kingdom of God? Now, theologians will talk, talk your ear off on what they think the kingdom of God is. But I think they would all agree the kingdom of God is where God reigns. The kingdom of God is his reign over his people for their good and his glory. So the reign of God is just not his absolute sovereignty. So God reigns over, he's our father who is in heaven. And that really speaks about his sovereignty. He's over everything. He can control everything. Nothing happens outside the control of God. So that's his absolute sovereignty over over all creation, over us as people and his creation. But the kingdom of God or the reign of God is also a redemptive reign. That's one of the key characteristics of it. It is a redemptive reign that transforms hearts and creates obedience. So what does that mean? That means that the kingdom of God is not a political entity of any kind. It's not a geographical political entity of any kind. See, the kingdom of God does not come through political action or some kind of cultural influence that we might want to exert. 
Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world in John chapter 18, 13. Now, don't get me wrong. Political power and cultural influence influences are not unimportant. But uh, we can never change the hearts of people, those who don't know God, who don't hallow his name, who have not come into a saving relationship with God through the work of Jesus Christ. We can't change their hearts through political action or cultural influence, nor can we provide the forgiveness that they need for their transgressions against God. God's kingdom is not political. It is not something we can vote in or have some politician give us. It is established in the hearts of people through the work of the Holy Spirit as he convinces people of their need of God, of their sin, of the righteousness that they need from God that is found in Jesus Christ. So the second thing the Bible says about the kingdom of God, or at least what I believe is important about the kingdom of God is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 20. There Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Hmm. Now, again, he's not talking about political power, right? This means the kingdom of God is not just something that you talk about. It's not conceptual. It's not confessional. It's not creedal in that way. It's, ha it's not something you sit around and debate and discuss and dialogue about. The kingdom of God, it says, is not a matter of talk, but of power. That means when he talks about power, he means it's transformational. He means it is something that changes your life. It's just not head knowledge, right? Remember James talking about, you know, it's just not good enough to say, these words, be warm, be fed, be, no, you have to do something. It changes your heart as you look at those people in need and you want to help them. You want to provide mercy. You want to provide grace to people. See, the problem is a lot of people, all they want to do is have a lot of words and talk. They sit around and discuss doctrine and discuss the Bible and they discuss the applications of the Bible, but they really never do anything about it. It's just a nice thing to discuss. And the kingdom of God, as Paul tells us, is not about words. It's about power. It's transformational. It is experiential. Uh, we also know, and as I mentioned before, it is a redemptive reign that transforms the hearts and creates obedience. The prophet Jeremiah spoke of a day when God would inaugurate a new covenant when the law would no longer be written on tablets of stone, but would instead be written on tablets of people's hearts. In other words, the law would no longer only be something outside of us, demanding obedience and condemning us of our failure, but instead it would be something God etches on our hearts and give it, giving us the power to obey his commandments. Through his death, Jesus Christ has established that new covenant. And it is secured by faith in Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross. And it is applied to our lives, to our hearts, through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's transformational. It's just not informational. It's transformational. It's not political. It's experiential. It changes our heart. That's why the Bible talks about repentance. That is changing the direction of your life. It's coming to your senses about God, who he is, his, the need of accepting him as a holy God, as a God who loves us as our fathers, but a God who we are separated from because of our rebellion against God and our headlong pursuit of our agenda and not God's agenda. So the kingdom of God is something that is already here on earth, but not yet fully present. Okay, the kingdom of God is something that is already here on earth, but is not yet fully present. In other words, the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. 
It's been started, but not yet consummated. We haven't seen the finished product, if I can put it that way. Uh, this kingdom arrived with the coming of Christ, who urged his hearers to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, Christians are now part of that kingdom. Paul says, or Paul states, God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and or transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And that's what we read in first uh, in Colossians chapter one, verse 13. So where is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is king. If he's king in your heart, then the kingdom of God is within you. If he's king in heaven, then the kingdom of God is in heaven. If he's king here on earth, as one day when he comes back, he will be, then the kingdom of God is on earth. Wherever Jesus is king, uh, that's where the kingdom of God is. Wherever his rule and reign is, that's where the kingdom of God is. So that's the first petition. That's our desire. God, bring your kingdom to this earth. Your kingdom come is that petition. The next petition is uh, in the Lord's Prayer is thy will be done. And this explains the petition it follows. So it explains uh, your kingdom come. See, the kingdom of God is found where the will of God is done, right? That's kind of what we've been talking about, isn't it? When theologians talk about the will of God, they're referring to one of two things. First, Scripture speaks of what we call God's sovereign will. That's the first way that we it is described or used in the Scriptures. When the Scripture speaks of God's will in this sense, it refers to his absolute sovereign rule over all things, God in heaven. And I made reference to that. The Apostle Paul spoke of God's will in this sense in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, when he says, he or he affirms that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Nothing happens outside the will of God. So that's God's sovereign will. Everybody is under God's sovereign will, whether we like it or not. It's we are ruled by God in one way or another. The second scripture also, the uh, second way scripture also uses the phrase, the will of God to, uh, is to refer to the commandments of God or the re revealed will of God. And the revealed will of God speaks to what God expects of us as his creation. And the Ten Commandments is an excellent example of God's revealed will. The call to repentance and believe the gospel is another example of God's revealed will, according to Acts chapter 17, verse 30. The Bible contains God's real will, a revealed will. And that's why we uh, believe in the Bible. That's why we uh, believe in the uh, inspiration of Scripture. That's why we believe that we need to stand up for all of the scripture and just not cut it apart to our liking. We believe in the whole Bible. So as J.I. Packer notes, he says this about this petition. Here, more clearly than anywhere, the purpose of prayer becomes plain. Not to make God do my will, which he, which is practicing magic, that's what he says, but to bring my will into line with his, which is what it means to practice true religion. So how do I apply these two petitions to my life? The petitions to uh, where we pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. How do I apply these to my life, especially when I'm in uncontrollable circumstances or in circumstances where I have no control or where I can't make the changes that are needed to rectify the situation. How do those two petitions apply to that? Well, these proclamations 
are proclamations of surrender. The petitions here are petitions of surrender. You could say they are a prayer of surrender. When I make these petitions, I am saying, or I am putting God in charge of my life and circumstances. I am surrendering control of my life and circumstances to God, his kingdom, and his will. What does it mean to pray these petitions of surrender? Well, it means I have made a choice. If I have an uncontrollable circumstance in my life, the solution is surrender. The solution is surrender to our Father in heaven. Uh, the solution is surrender because he is our Father in heaven. We have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, a father-child relationship. I surrender because my greatest desire is to see his name hallowed. I pray that. I ask God, may all the people in this world see you as God, as hallowed, as holy, separate from us, uh, his creation. That's my desire, that people will really see God for who he is, come to their senses about God. I surrender because I want to see his kingdom come in my life, in my family, in my community. I surrender by doing his will and not my will. My surrender is not one of resignation. It is not something passive. It is a choice that I make to seek God's glory, to seek his kingdom, and to do his will and not the will of anyone else around me. Surrender is the only solution for serenity in these unsettled times and circumstances, in these times when our life is facing all of these things that we have no control over. You know, you have probably heard uh, the prayer of surrender. You know, uh, AA, all these different organizations use that prayer. And it's, you know, you know it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. Well, that's a kind of a nice poem, to be honest. In many ways, the serenity prayer that I just read is a model prayer for the post-Christian society. It says nothing about the character of God or the plight of man. It says nothing about the need of redemption or the nature of the gospel. See, the serenity, the serenity prayer is nothing more than a generic prayer for people with a generic religious conviction of some kind. I'm not passively surrendering to my circumstances. I am surrendering to my Father, His kingdom, and His will. And that is a very, very difficult thing to do. The Lord's Prayer, in many ways, is not a prayer of serenity. It is a prayer of surrender. It is a radical prayer. It is a life-changing prayer. You know, we often... Uh, use it cavalier, in a cavalier way. Uh, we often, you know, we just recite the Lord's Prayer and we say, well, you know, I've just said this thing. And it's almost like where Christ talks about people babbling and thinking they're going to, you know, affect God's will in some way by the number of words they say. And sometimes I think we use that. We use the Lord's Prayer as some kind of magic potion, you know, to sanctify things or something of that nature. And oftentimes we recite it uh, with a, a thoughtless, careless, cavalier attitude. But we need to understand something. If you really study the scriptures, if you really study God's word, if you really understand the life of Jesus Christ and what he is saying, the Lord's Prayer is a dangerous prayer, especially when we pray, your kingdom come your will be done. When we are praying something like this, we are praying something incredibly dangerous that imperils 
our comfort. When we pray your kingdom come, your will be done, we are valuing or we are saying that we are valuing God's agenda over our agenda, our personal agenda, that God's agenda is so much more important than what my agenda is. By making God's kingdom paramount in our heart, we are setting aside our own sad attempts at personal glory to pursue the glory of our King, to pursue the glory of God, the glory of Jesus Christ. See, the human heart is naturally hostile to the kingdom of God. And it just started with Adam and Eve because it challenges our sense of identity and commitment to our self-glorification. And you might not say, well, I'm not trying to glorify myself. Yes, you are through your own personal agenda. You're saying this will make me happy by doing this. This will. This is what is going to bring me uh, pleasure and prestige and power in my society or in my community of people. See, the Lord's Prayer is a dangerous prayer. The petition, your kingdom come, your will be done, is a very dangerous statement to make. But these petitions also carry with them a great hope and great comfort, especially for the believer in these stressful times. Our God will come to redeem us, to save us from this world, and to bring us into the fullness of his kingdom in the final revelation of his kingdom at the second coming of Jesus Christ that we believe the Bible teaches so clearly, that Christ is coming again. This isn't the end of the story. Christ is the end of the story. And we put our hope, our 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 agenda focused upon the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, if you go through the Lord's Prayer, you'll see that there is a a logic that runs through this prayer. Each petition is connected to the other. In the first petition, Jesus teaches us or taught us to hallow the name of God, that this is God's number one priority, that his name would be hallowed. Uh, He is outlining our number one priority, that God would be hallowed in our lives, that he would be seen as holy, and that we reflect that holiness on our life. Unless the name of God is regarded as holy, you got to understand this, unless we come to our senses about God and regard him as holy, his kingdom will not come to this world or our life. If we uh, regard his name as holy, then we have a responsibility to make the kingdom of God manifest. See, the task of each believer is to make this invisible kingdom a visual kingdom by living in such a way that we bear witness to the reality of the kingship of God and of Christ in our job, in our family, in all the decisions that we make in our schools, because God is king over all aspects of our lives. That's what we believe. The only way the kingdom of God is going to be manifested in this world before Christ comes again is for us to live as citizens of that kingdom, to live as citizens of heaven and subject our lives to the rule of Christ. So I pray in these uncertain times, I pray especially for myself, that those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and have entered into his kingdom, because that's the promise of scripture, we are no longer citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. Uh, It is my prayer that we will make visible that invisible kingdom to those around us, especially in these times of challenge as we look forward to the second coming 
of Jesus Christ. May God bless you this week.